Hello, I'm Father Michael Barrett at St. Agnes Church here in Midtown Manhattan. Today we're going to have a brief class on Christmas. Now, Christmas is enormous. There's a lot of different things we can discuss about it, but these are just some details that might help us. I think the first thing we have to remember is Christmas is the most important day in the history of the world. Some people think it's just a Christian thing, that's why we call it Christmas, but it is God himself entering into the universe as one of us and entering into our history. Mind-boggling. Mind-boggling for all of history, not just our history. So objectively, that's an important thing about how it's changed the world and even the universe. Uh, subjectively, it's very important because so many people celebrate it. So many people obviously are involved with it. Not only Christians, obviously, but also many non-Christians who celebrate the feast day. For example, in Japan, Christmas is a big deal, not because there are many Catholics or Christians, but because of the culture surrounding Christmas. It's a big part of who we are celebrating. It wasn't always completely that way, and that's what we'll just touch on a little bit today. So Christmas is an important day, objectively, subjectively. It um, is Christ, and originally it would have been Mass, Christ, Christ Mass. Sometimes you'll see it as X Mass, and that X is Chi, which is for Christ. So even though it's X Mass, it's not so bad as far as being uh, irreverent. But in any case, these ideas of Christmas are very important. Now, we can say that, why did we decide that it's December the 25th? Part of why we decided it's December the 25th is March 25th. I'm simplifying things, but March 25th is the Annunciation. And I think we have to see that the church is relevant in these things. March 25th is the Annunciation. Obviously, December the 25th should be the birth of Christ. Why is March 25th the Annunciation? Well, because it's the vernal equinox. It's an important time in the history of the world where, um, where we see something about nature, both March 25th and December. March 25th is when the day is the longest. It's the beginning of, a, you could say, a new world. And it makes sense that at that time in the world is when Jesus is conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Annunciation telling her that she's to be the mother of God. December the 25th, according to the Roman times, it was the um, winter solstice. which means that December the 25th was the longest day, uh, pardon, the longest night in the world. Why is this important? Now we say it's usually December 21 or 22, but in the Roman calendar it was December the 25th is the way they understood it. Very interesting that on the shortest day, Christ comes into the world, the new light, and, and it begins this great enlightening of the world through this new light. It happens in any case because that's when the sun begins to be stronger. We begin to realize that somehow the relationship between the sun and the sun are connected in a certain way. At times they talked about Jesus being the son of righteousness in the Old Testament. So there were notions of the idea that somehow our Lord was this powerful figure much like the sun is in our nature. But in any case, we begin to realize that there, there is this relationship in our very own creation about the sun. And I say that because I think it can help us a bit. The, um, in the beginning, the notion of sun and so on was not absolutely very clear, 
but they claim that December the 25th was first celebrated in 336 A.D. in Rome, just to give us a, a starting date of when it was begun. Some people said it probably started before 336 A.D. in Rome, but it's recorded as having occurred at 336 A.D. in Rome. It became something of importance because many people realized what it was. Probably one of the things that helps us understand that is that Charlemagne, the king of the Holy Roman Empire, don't ask me to spell this correctly, but anyway, he was crowned on 800 on Christmas Day. Now, if you go to St. Peter's Basilica, you walk into St. Peter's Basilica, when you walk in, you see this gigantic red porphyry in the floor. That was the spot where Charlemagne was. That, that porphyry was where he was when the Pope crowned him as the Holy Roman Empire. So Christmas began to be kind of an important thing. Sometimes January the 6th became important, which we know as the baptism of our Lord. But in the Eastern Church, many times it became more important than December the 25th. In a sermon by St. Augustine, which would be the late 4th century, the late 300s, he says, hence it is that he was born on the day which is the shortest in our earthly reckoning and from which subsequent days begin to increase in length. So that's Augustine, way back in those times. It, it, eventually, the people were playing around with these dates, and, and there is a certain logic, the notion of December the 25th being wintertime. Uh, the, the notion of both these days com coming into creation through the longest night and the shortest night, the longest day, the shortest day and the longest day. And we begin to realize that somehow God builds creation and then within the creation that he creates, he also enters into it in his humanity. Kind of interesting, you know, where we see the cultural as well as the religious united under these circumstances. Um, so this idea of March 25th being the Annunciation probably became something that was more and more accepted. And they say that the holiday as an Annunciation was created in the seventh century, and it was assigned to a date that is nine months before Christmas. So which came first, the Annunciation or Christmas? Some say the Annunciation came first. Others say Christmas certainly had a prevalence. Probably from a cultural point of view, Christmas had more of a prevalence from a religious point of view, uh, the Annunciation did as well. Tertullian, who died in 220, lived in Latin-speaking North America, and he gives the date of the Passion of our Lord as March 25th. Not the Annunciation, but the Passion. Why is that important? Well, in ancient times, a great man was born and died on the same day. There was something unique about that. So the idea was that he was announced on March the 25th and he died on March the 25th, which was Easter. Um, it stated that for a while, the date of Passion, later in 165, was moved from March 25th to Sunday. And that's where we sometimes have heard of the decisions about when do we celebrate Easter? Well, as you know, now we celebrate Easter according to the sun, not according to the date. So Easter moves around. In some parts of the church, it's still, in the Eastern church, it's still more according to the date. But at that time, they felt that Good Friday in 165, uh, was moved to Good Friday in 165 when Pope Soter created Easter by reassigning the resurrection to a Sunday. A little confusing. And I don't want to spend too much time thinking about it, but it is kind of interesting of how this, how this culture comes together and how the whole idea of a man 
but being born and dying on the same day for a great man, and Jesus was the greatest man that ever lived. Um, so they, they call this um, a calculation that's a hypothesis of the way our Lord came into the world, but it has a lot of grounds in historical data. In 204, Hippolytus, one of the fathers of the church, in 204, Hippolytus is the man who's behind the second Eucharistic prayer. He said that um, December the 25th was the date of the Nativity. Interesting uh, historical thing. It's um, sometimes said to be one of the earliest dates claiming that December 25th is the Nativity. There's a different approach of this hypothesis to another one that's called the history of religions hypothesis, for what it's worth. And, and that comes into the whole notion of going back to that notion of Jesus' as son with a U and son with an O. The Romans had a celebration of Saul Invictus when they said that was when the son was born which they claim uh, in 274, it would be around December the 25th. In 274, and already we see before 274, Christmas was celebrated. So it's kind of a, a funny thing that they said that they took a pagan cultural thing of the birth of the sun and transformed it into the day of Christmas. Okay, interesting. If you like it, take it. But as I said, 274 is a little bit after what we think Christmas was originally celebrated as. So Aurelian placed a festival of Sol Invictus, which means in English from, from Latin as the unconquerable sun, the victorious sun, on December the 25th in order to compete with the growing rate of the Christmas church, which, ha which had already been celebrating Christmas on that date ahead of time. Which is, you know, it's kind of interesting that Aurelius was taking advantage of the Christian side rather than the Christians taking advantage of the Roman side. Okay, so some ideas of where the dates come from. Um, it all has its relationship according to the calendar, but all has its relationship according to the way creation is made. It's good to realize that Christmas has not always been this great big universal holiday the way uh, it is more or less now, although now I think it's becoming less celebrated in a lot of parts of the world, certainly in the United States. I think some people are complaining that ending Christmas in order to uh, control the virus and so on is part of a kind of a bigger plan of undermining the celebration of Christmas for other things. And yes, on the one hand, we have various religions and so we can't just focus on Christmas. But yet on the other hand, Christmas is still Christmas. It's when God, when God became man. Can't get around that. You can argue all you want, but you can't get around that. And you can say, well, that's just what Catholics believe, that's what Christians believe, that's what certain other people believe but it is also the reality. It's not belief, it is real that God became man. Was it December the 25th? Maybe not. Was it close? Maybe, who knows, but it happened. That's the bottom line. So Christmas was banned on more than one occasion over the history of the world, really. The Puritans hated Christmas. The Jehovah's Witnesses hated Christmas. Um, there were other things that were celebrated called Yuletide, and we see people with the Yuletide log and the Yuletide celebration, which some people say it's still uh, another way of celebrating Christmas. It's not something pagan that became Christmas. It was something that went together. In the early Middle Ages, Christmas became a little bit overshadowed by the Epiphany, which is January 6th, but now we know it's Sunday nearest January 6th. The epiphany is God ex exposing himself, is what it comes down to. It's a moment when he 
exposes himself to the world by the three wise men who are pagans, who were not Christian at all, weren't following Christianity, weren't following Judaism, probably were following Zoroastrianism, but they were astrologers and they saw this unusual star in the sky. Uh, again, you can find astrologers or astronomers who will tell you that that star really existed at that time. Nobody knew exactly what it was, but that star somehow brought the three wise men to our Lord in the stable, the manger, at Christmas Day. But it uh, comes back to this notion that it was still Christmas. You know, we still had this thing that they called the 40 Days of St. Martin, which began on November 11th, which was the feast day of St. Martin. And it would go for 40 days, which really comes down to Advent. Later on, its name was changed as Advent. And then after Charlemagne became king on Christmas Day, then Christmas expanded in its notion. People accepted it more widely throughout the empire. All kinds of things took place, caroling and hymns and customs. But in a later time, when we get into the 1600s, with the Protestant Reformation having already taken place, a lot of people felt that Christmas was evil because people got drunk, they had too much to drink, they fooled around, they did crazy things, so they went against Christmas. Um, that was not healthy, but that's the way it was among certain Protestants. They say that Charles Dickens and other writers helped in the revival of the holiday by changing consciousness of Christmas and the way in which it was celebrated as they emphasized family, religion, gift giving, social reconciliation, as opposed to some people who saw it as sort of a historic revelry and uh, bringing people into troublesome places. There's a professor here in the United States who says that Martin Luther inaugurated a period in which Germany would produce a unique culture of Christmas, much copied in North America. Among the congregations of the Dutch Reformed Church, Christmas was celebrated as one of the principal evangelical feasts. So uh, in the 17th century, in the 1600s, in the 17th century, the Puritans strongly condemned the celebration of Christmas, considering it a Catholic invention and the trappings of popery or the rags of the beast. The restoration of some of this notion of Christmas took place in 1660, so the 1700s, uh, by King Charles II, but many Calvinist clergymen still disapproved of Christmas celebration. The Parliament of Scotland officially abolished the observance of Christmas in 1640. It was not until 1958 that Christmas again became a Scottish public holiday. 1958. In colonial America, the pilgrims of New England shared the radical Protestant disapproval of Christmas. The Plymouth pilgrims put their loathing for the day into practice in 1620 1620, when they spent their first Christmas day in the New World working, thus demonstrating their complete contempt for the day. Christmas observance was outlawed in Boston in 1659. It was not until the mid-19th century that celebrating Christmas became fashionable in the Boston region. I say these things, I think they're kind of interesting. You know, here we are, people get upset, we're worried about Christmas and different things, which we should be, but the development of the feast, it's gone through a lot of difficult times over the centuries. First to establish December 25th, March 25th, but over the years of celebrating Christmas in the way that, we, the way that we're accustomed to. In the 19th century, from this pretty much we will have to wrap up what we're talking about today. 
is when Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol. That's why Christmas Carol is such an important book, because it revived the spirit of Christmas and the notion that we hold it. And one of the phrases that came out of that book, a prominent phrase, was Merry Christmas. How often do we hear about this? Happy Holidays or Merry Christmas? Well, the first time it really came out was through Charles Dickens in The Christmas Carol. So we see that over the years, a lot of things have happened of developing things. The Christmas tree came up. The first Christmas tree in England was in 1848. That's, you know, not that far back, at least as you get to my age. And uh, the whole notion of the idea of the royal family somehow celebrating Christmas in this way was very important for the rest of us. In 1822, Clement Moore wrote the poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas, which also brought back some of this culture that we try to live today. Um, some people see that that also brought in commercialism more than spiritual, but whatever the case was, it, it was trying to bring Christmas back into the middle of the world. The first Congregational Church of Rockford, Illinois, although a genuine Puritan stock, was prepared for a grand Christmas jubilee, a news correspondent reported in 1864. So at that time. And then uh, in the 20th century, we really didn't see Christmas developing that much even until the 1950s. So this gives us some idea about Christmas, the great feast that we celebrate, the great feast that is spiritually so important for the whole world, and the great feast that's very important for the culture and the activities that families do living with one another, growing closer to one another, basically through getting closer to Jesus Christ born on that day. Thank you for coming. See you again soon.